I'm Raluca, this is Daniele, and our supervisors are Omar, Ulrich, and Dong. Um, earlier this year, there's been a scandal in the US Senate. A senator from, the South, from South Carolina alleged that uh, one of her colleagues approached her to trade votes with her. This senator uh, proposed a bill that would uh, regulate the use of firearms and dangerous weapons in high schools. So it was kind of a hot topic. Um, and she said that someone approached her to trade votes. And this sparked a huge debate on whether vote trading is moral or not, because members of the US Senate was, were split on this. Um, so I presented this case just to introduce, to introduce you the topic. Um, what motivates this project is that there is so much talk about vote trading, but all we have about it is anecdotal evidence. And just to make things clear, I will shortly define vote trading. So vote trading means that um, two legislators exchange votes. So one, um, imagine that me and Daniel are legislators. He cares about, he proposes a bill. And I don't care that much about it, uh, but I do care about my bill that I will propose next week. So I make an agreement with him that I will give him my vote in exchange for his. Um, when it comes to the US Supreme, Supreme Court, which is one of the institutions, institutions that we studied, uh, we have plenty of anecdotal evidence dating back to 1940s, for example. So we have whole books on this topic, but we don't have very good empirical data on it. Similarly, we don't have good definitions and concepts about vote trading. Um, so the aim of this project was to improve our understanding about vote trading. And this project is rooted in the methodology developed by Omar and Ulrich on vote trading. Uh, they are looking at US, so they, they developed this vote methodology to investigate vote trading in democratic institutions by looking at the US Congress. Um, now the aim of the internship was to develop a common framework to study vote trading. I am looking at the US Supreme Court and Daniel is looking at the General Assembly of the UN. Okay, so in order to study the extent of this phenomenon in these two different institutions, we implemented the methodology developed by our supervisors. And for this methodology, we need three pieces of information. Okay, so the first one are just the observed votes of the legislators. So from the example, you can see that legislator A voted yes on bill X, on bill Y, and on bill Z. Legislator B instead voted yes only on Bill X and on Bill Z. Then we need some kind of predictions about the expected voting behavior of those legislators. Now, there are several ways in which, can, uh, in which we can form these predictions. Uh, for instance, we can use regressions with variables that we know from the literature that are important predictors of voting behavior. For instance, a politician's ideology. Okay? The important thing is that by the end of this step, we end up with uh, the probability of a politician voting yes on a specific bill. Okay? In the example, uh, we know that legislator A was very, very likely to vote yes just on bill X, and legislator B vo uh, was uh, very, very likely to vote yes just on bill Z. Now, we need a last piece of information that is related to the revealed preferences of legislators towards the different bill. And in this case, we can use, for instance, the sponsors of the drif uh, different draft of the bills. So, for instance, in the, in the example, legislator A was the sponsor of bill X, and legislator B was the sponsor of bill Z. Then we combine all this information. So we look at the observed votes, and we compare them with our predictions. When they do not match, it means that we have a deviation from the expected voting behavior. Then we need to direct that deviation to a beneficiary. Who is going to be the beneficiary? Well, the beneficiary is going to be the sponsor of the bill considered. So, in our example, legislator A was not supposed to vote yes on bill Z, but we do observe a yeah vote. Okay, so this is the, a deviation. Who is the beneficiary of that deviation? Well, the sponsor of Bill Z, that is this guy here. Okay, so we repeat the, um, the procedure for all the bills and all the legislators in order to get a directed deviations network. 
then we look only at those deviations that are reciprocal, okay? And we assume that those deviations are trades. So from the directed deviations network, we can actually extract the vote trading network, okay? The point is that, as you can see under our framework, we consider vote trading in its simplest form. So a quid pro quo relationship where the form of payment is the same, so a deviation from the expected voting behavior within the same legislature. Legislature, sorry. Um, from the directed deviations network, we can also compute an aggregate measure of the reciprocity of, uh, in these deviations within the network. That is the log rolling index. So first of all, how do we compute this index? So first of all, we compute the level of reciprocity between two nodes that are two legislators. That is just the minimum amount of directed edges between them. We sum these uh, reciprocated edges we divide them by the total number of edges to get the reciprocity estimator, and from the reciprocity estimator, we get the log rolling index. That works like a correlation coefficient, so it takes positive value if these deviations are systematically reciprocated, and it takes negative value if deviations are systematically not reciprocated. Now, as you can see, in the log rolling index, actually, we are comparing the value of the reciprocity estimator from our data that we get from our data to the mean value of the reciprocity, uh, reciprocity estimator under a null hypothesis. A null hypothesis that has to be specified by the researchers, so by us. Yeah, we are the researchers. So in, in our application, we consider a fairly simple null hypothesis that, see, that is, in this alternative world governed by the null, the deviations that we observe are not intentional, but are just the results of random errors. So we apply this methodology to our two institutional settings, and this is what we found. Okay. Oh, no? <laughs> the institution I worked on is the U.S. Supreme Court, and just to give you a brief introduction to it, uh, the, Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court is the highest court in the U.S., uh, and it's formed of nine judges. Um, they each have a vote on each case, so there are nine votes on a case. Um, in addition to the votes, the judges write the reasoning behind the decision and they put it in an opinion, which is a, which is a piece of judicial text that we also use in our analysis. Um, but just for the votes, just from the votes, using data from the 1947 to 2017, um, we create, um, using the VTN methodology, we find out that there is some vote trading within the U.S. Supreme Court because our log rolling index is a, pos is a positive one. Uh, here we have the, the network of the justices. Um, we identified 120 trades, so the, the, those are res reciprocal trades in our network. Um, each node in the network is a justice, and they are red, with, uh, the red or the Republicans, blue or, blue or the Democrats. Uh, the size of each node is uh, proportional to the degree of centrality of the justices in the network. And the edges um, are weighted. So if there are more trades, then the edge is uh, a bit darker. Um, yeah, yeah. That's about it. Okay, what about the UN General Assembly? Well, I got the opposite result, so a negative index. Um, uh, what does it mean? So. In my case, actually, the vote trading network is not really informative because it appears that in this context, deviations are systematically not reciprocated. What does it mean? We have a lot of guys that deviate from their expected vo voting behavior in order to benefit someone, but they receive nothing in exchange, or at least they do not receive a payment in the same form. We do not observe it. I think that this is a pretty interesting result that should be analyzed further. And one possible explanation is that actually we are considering, uh, let's say, the time span of our data set as a single legislature. Instead, it m will make more sense to like, uh, split the sample in sub-periods and apply the methodology to specific periods in order to get uh, like specific, uh, specific periods of cooperation. Okay. So a negative result for the UNGA. Uh, uh, 
one of the, the main outcome of this project was to have two research papers, which we are working on at the moment. Uh, we have two drafts, we just have to add, a, to add our co-authors, obviously. <laughs> um, and now we'll talk about the work in progress because three months was not enough time because we had to start from zero. Uh, so I will talk a bit about the, what we are doing now. Um, remember when I said that in the US Supreme Court you have the votes of the justices, but also they put the reasoning behind their decision in an opinion, which is this big piece of text. Um, the opinion will have some data on the case and then it will have the opinions of all the just justices. If all the justices vote the same, so if the decision is unanimous, that happens on more than half of the cases, then all the opinions are put here together. None, uh, none of the justices is identified by name. However, it doesn't happen all the time that the decision are unanimous, so some justices will disagree. And in that case, in that case, they will write a dissenting opinion if they completely disagree with the decision. If they disagree this is with the decision just in a small part, then they will write a concurring opinion. Um, and if they disagree, but they end at the same result, but for some different reasons, then they will write special, a special concurrence. So remember when Daniele explained the methodology, he said that we use some signals to identify the possible trades. Um, we don't have that many signals at the moment for the US Supreme Court, but using sentiment analysis on the text of these opinions, we want to get more signals, so to get more possible trades, to see if there are more possible trades in our data. Okay, what about the UNGA? So I'm developing an agent-based model to simulate my institutional setting, and then I have a switch to turn off and on cooperation between the agents. And then I want to turn on cooperations and try to apply the methodology to see if I'm effectively able to capture it. This will be useful not just to validate the methodology, but also to consider that uh, time dimension that I mentioned before, so that I can turn on cooperation just on specific periods and see if by applying the methodology I'm able to capture just those periods of cooperation. So, and then the last slide, that is about our internship experience because it's not just about uh, research but also about the experience itself. So we came here almost three months ago with a background that I guess it's quite different from what you're used to see at the Alan Turing because, well, Raluca, she's a pure political scientist. I'm more a kind of hybrid because I'm half political scientist, half an economist with a, just a bit of knowledge about programming. And by now I can say that we are kind of proficient in two programming languages. <laughs> and we developed skills in um, network science, text analysis, uh, sentiment analysis. We, um, we learn how to do web scraping. We learn how to run simulations, how to develop an agent-based model. We developed our presentation skills, as you can see, uh, because we had to present at least once a week to our supervisors our progress. And we also learn how to collaborate within a common research project through GitHub. So this last slide is just to say thank you to our supervisors for all the help, all the training that they gave us during this summer. So yes, thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs>